Today's lecture, I'm going to be talking about mapping um, as we continue to move on through our course on bioinformatics. Uh, some of the things that um, we're going to be covering today uh, will include on understanding why mapping is important in genomic research, uh, how mapping is a subset of some of the problems that we've already been talking about with sequence alignment, also, um, making sure that we understand exactly what we mean when we talk about a heuristic method, um, being familiar with some of the main algorithmic approaches to mapping. I'm not going to go into incredible detail about this, but I do want you guys to at least have an understanding of what are the different types of approaches that people are, are implementing in different types of cases. Uh, then we're going to talk a little bit about some of the applications of mapping and where it's important in genomics. and um, We'll also go over a little bit uh, uh, explicitly in RNA-seq about um, why it's important uh, in calculating things like gene expression. So mapping. You've done your next generation sequencing run. You get back millions of reads. Now what are you going to do? Right. Well, first you're going to want to get rid of all the sort of low quality components that you might find in your uh, sequencing experiment. So maybe adapters, trim out low quality sequence, all that other business. Um, but then the next thing that you're typically want to going to want to do in a lot of studies is map your data to a reference. And then once you've done that, depending upon what your sequencing experiment was for, you're going to want to analyze your results. So that means that we have to understand what exactly this this mapping step is, right? Um, and so mapping uh, is we would define as the alignment of sequencing of sequencing reads to a reference sequence. And it involves a couple different terms, right? We've got the term read here. And when we talk about read, we're talking about a, an individual sequence coming off uh, from a sequencing run. Uh, we talk about reference. Here we're talking about something that we're going to be considered, we're going to be considering as known. So a sequence that already exists that we think is well assembled, well annotated, um, is a good, accurate representation of something that we're interested in. And finally, we need to do an alignment. Um, and we're going to use methods that are similar but a little bit different uh, than what we've talked about before when we talk about that kind of alignment. So, uh, you know, we've talked about sequence alignments already. There's various kinds. They can be defined by the numbers of sequences. There can be pairwise, multiple sequence alignments. They can occur at different scales. There can be global alignments or local alignments, right? We're either aligning the whole, aligning the whole sequences to each other or just pieces of the sequences. And when we talk about the elements of a sequence alignment, you know, we talked about previously about how they, they can be defined um, by the matches and mismatches, mismatches that we see in the aligned sequences, um, the insertion of gaps, and um, typically when we do these alignments, how we decide which alignment score we think is the best, we would eventually include some sort of alignment score, right? And this alignment score usually has some sort of uh, scoring system in place that revolves around how many substitutions we might see in an alignment and how we might score gaps. So when we talk about uh, read alignment or mapping in this case, um, it's going to have four specific components that we're going to be having to having to interact with. Um, so the process includes a, a map, right? And this would be defined as the locations in a set of reference sequences where a uh, where a read would best match, right? And the main thing here is in this map, what we're trying to find, uh, this process consists of identifying a target and the position on that target where this uh, component with this read would go. It really is like a map, right? Where does, where does this read belong? Where does it, where does it live? Um, we need a model also in this process. Um, uh, a model in this case would be a framework used to choose or distinguish between matches and alignment. We're talking about DNA sequences here. There could be parts of that sequence that align to all different parts of, to very many parts of the genome, or the read itself may just align to multiple parts of the genome. How do we 
understand the process by which we're going to generate those alignments. What what are we gonna how are we gonna identify something as an alignment? And that model is the framework that we're gonna use to do that. It's also gonna need an algorithm. And this is usually a method that we would say uh, would be designed to assess the results of the model. So once we have an alignment, is it a good alignment? How do we establish that that is the place where the read goes, that that is the actual map to that location? Um, and some reads may go to more than one location. It's also really important. Uh, and finally, we're going to need data structures or code, right? So we're going to actually have to implement uh, this algorithm and model and there are all kinds of challenges involved with that. It's not an inconsequential inco part because the speed at which we're able to accomplish these tasks has a direct relationship between whether or not we're actually going to want to utilize that approach or utilize a different approach. Um, and the reliability of it. Is it is, are, the, are the approaches that we're going to be using repeatable um, and reliable? So not an inconsequential component. So among the different ways to, there, there are a variety of different ways to do mapping. And we've actually already sort of talked about one of those ways when we talked about some of our sequence alignment uh, uh, examples. Uh, and so dynamic programming is an example of sort of this alignment-based approach. And we talked about this before, you know, it involves establishing a scoring matrix. And um, we studied the global version of this, of this path graph over here on the right side. Um, which is a, could, we could associate with the Neenaman Wunsch algorithm, right? And this is one of the ways that we were able to do pairwise alignments. We talked about doing local alignments like the Swift Waterman, so if it's down here in the lower right hand corner of the screen. Um, and in this process, we established, you know, a model in which we were, uh, we had affine gap penalties for, you know, opening and extending gaps. Um, we had uh, uh, mismatch scores and a scoring uh, scoring rules associated with this process. But one of the things about this process, we talked about this a little bit previously, is that you know for a couple sequences this is fine, but it's relatively computationally expensive. So if you are aligning you know 100 base pairs by 100 base pairs, um, you need to calculate about 10,000 scores, right, to fill out this entire matrix. So it's a lot of scores that you're going to actually have to calculate out. And um, remember, you're doing three calculations for basically every single one of these cells on the, or every single one of these nodes in this, in this graph. And so uh, that ends up to be quite a few um, floating point operations or flops per score. Um, and if we're going to align, you know, a hundred base sequence to the human genome, uh, ends up requiring, you know, several teraflops of, uh, of of calculations, and that's a lot of calculations, right? And that's just for one hundred base pair sequence to um, the human genome. So obviously, just this this method with nothing else would seem to be way too computationally intensive for us to run like a large algorithm like Blast, where we're trying to look at all different types of references and do these alignments, or even just one genome, it would just be incredibly computationally expensive. Um, and so as we talked about previously, you know, BLAST has actually solved this problem by um, taking a heuristic approach. Um, and remember, heuristic algorithms, uh, these are algorithms that make approximations to speed up um, processes. And, uh, you know, BLAST is an example of this. Um, and if we think about how this works in BLAST, you know, we're going to sort of walk through a couple of series of steps, and they tend to sort of build on similar concepts. So one of the ways that BLAST works, right, is that it, it starts off by identifying these matching k-tuples. And a k-tuple um, is equivalent to another term that we used before, um, a k-mer, right? And this is a string of k-length. And um, the k that we pick will then determine the speed and the sensitivity of the search that we're going to be able to do. So, you know, for a shorter k, um, smaller number um, string length, uh, it'll go faster, right? Because uh, it'll have shorter things that I'll need to search for and match. But if we're uh, if we want it to be more sensitive, we'll make that K larger so that it'll actually carry more information. And the matches that it will have will have more of an opportunity to make more unique matches and find the one place where this thing might go. 
Another really big step is this searching part, right? And so what are we actually going to be searched? So sure, I can break my sequence up into k length strings pretty easy, but then I need to go and I need to search for what it's going to match up to. And to do that, uh, I'm going to have to build some type of lookup array. And this is going to be, a, a, so if I'm mapping one sequence to a reference, I need to build a lookup array of the reference sequence of all its possible k tuples. So I have to figure out where I can find a k tuple or a kmer from my my the read that I want to map, and I, and how am I going to match that up to the reference that I want to map it to? Um, and so to do this, we usually make something called a hash, and you can think about a hash as being something akin to a dictionary in, in Python that you might be familiar with, um, in terms of it being a data structure. And so this, this lookup array, or something that we might also refer to as a hash map, is a process by which we can take a bunch of keys, in this case, uh, the example here, we have names and phone numbers, right? We can take these keys, we can put them through some sort of hash function, and through this hash function, we can map them to buckets. And in these buckets are values, right? And the, the way that these buckets are coded Right there, they'll they'll have uh, the value here that this key is associated with will automatically be able to tell us what the this bucket that that uh, this value is associated with. So this is the process by which we can quickly do this. And this hash function, um, it's an interesting. We'll talk more about it, but this is one of the ways basically we're able to reduce the amount of information um, that the uh, that the um, uh, computer has to hold um, in its memory, right? So this is one of the processes that we're going to speed it up. So we we take these keys, we use this hash function to map them to um, uh, values that are much easier and quicker to look up. And so the process by which we do that, from a practical standpoint in an algorithm like Blast, is we take uh, our sequence and we create a k-tuple um, array for it. Right for our reference sequence, and then we'll take our next sequence, and we'll find all the k-tuples uh, that it has in common with our lookup array. And any of these uh, things that it finds in common, we identify those things as hits. Once we have those hits, um, we'll we'll, we'll identify them all, and then we'll we'll locate them on the diagonals of those scoring matrices. So those are those uh, path graphs that we talked about. Um, that I showed in the previous slide. And what we'll tend to find is where we find good matches, we'll find several k-tuples on the same diagonal, and we'll refer to these as segments. Once we have established those segments, um, they can then be scored for matches and distances between matches, so these are gaps, um, and we can actually generate scores for these using whatever model we're gonna use. And then we can use an algorithm to identify, you know, what are our best segments um, and a way of selecting and joining these diagonals together. Uh, and finally, we'll just use a, a, an algorithm like uh, the Swift Waterman's or something similar to identify um, what's the highest scoring diagonal. So, um, Blast is a good example of a heuristic algorithm. You know, it restricts searches on smaller bands around matrix diagonals. It does not do all possible searches, right? So there's a restriction. It's an approximation of a process. Um, and when you do a blast, it'll often refer to the first step as um, creating a hash table of words, um, which it refers to as seeds, um, or we could refer to those also as seeds, excuse me. Uh, and then what it'll do is it'll find matches and then extend in both directions. So it'll find a bunch of word hits. And then once it finds these word hits, it'll begin to extend out without uh, first in all directions without gaps or mismatches. So it'll extend out in various ways and, um, until it hits a gap or a mismatch. Then it's going to take those extended matches and it's going to join... Um, regions while allowing for gaps and mismatches. So um, here we can see what's the effect of, of what happens when we change the, the word size. And what you'll see, right, as you get, as you increase the k size or the seed size, 
one of the things that you'll notice is that um, you get less and less matches, right? Um, and this is because you're getting a longer word, so you get it gets more specific. Um, but you can see, right, that even in all these cases, you do have these sort of diagonal process, these diagonal alignments. Um, so once we have our matches, we will then extend them, um, allowing for some uh, gaps and mismatches. Um, we'll then start to identify word clusters, and we'll also be able to see isolated words. We can find where um, we find words that are clustered together on diagonals. Um, once we have these clusters, then we can look and see, do they form larger diagonal pieces? Um, and we can identify regions that we consider to be consistent and inconsistent. Um, one thing that uh, it should be noted, because BLAST is a heuristic algorithm, so it's an approximation, it's not going to look at all places, it will miss alignments that are outside these regions that it establishes as this restricted region that it's looking for. So it's not going to identify or report back all the restricted regions. Now the important thing to realize is that BLAST is not just one algorithm, it's a collection of various algorithms together all working towards one purpose. Um, and so there are uh, different ways that um, these algorithms are presented, but for instance You'll have a BLAST N algorithm, which is targeted towards identifying shorter sequences, or MegaBLAST, which is identified towards finding longer sequences. So that's great for just sort of traditional sequence analysis, and we've all used BLAST in various cases. If we have a single sequence, we want to try to figure out what it is, what it matches to. Um, we're going to map it back to, to the best reference we can. However, when we're doing next-gen sequencing data, right, there's a lot more sequences. We're talking about millions and millions of sequences. And um, while a lot of times we're using similar algorithms, we can't use the same algorithms if for millions and millions of sequences. They need to be sped up. So how are we going to speed them up? Uh, well, there's a couple different ways that we could do that. We could think about the different ways that we define um, uh, how to do alignments. You know, there's that global versus local approach. Um, so do I need to look at all the data or can I look at part of the data? Um, are we going to allow gaps or are we not going to allow gaps? How are we going to think about mismatches? And probably the most important thing when we think about what allows things to be sped up for the kind of data that we're talking about is how do we create this index? How do we create this hash map of seeds, this lookup array, whatever you want to call it? Um, how do we create the index uh, for the reads and how do we uh, also create the index for the reference, right? So how are we going to create um, this process to, in, a, in a way that uh, we might be able to make it go a lot faster? And um, from this effort, there have been numerous algorithms that have tried to approach this problem. And I'm only going to talk about a handful of them today, like very few of them. Um, but there are a lot of different ways to do this. It's an active area of research, um, very interesting area of computer science. So one of the um, main ways that we could think about how this is accomplished is, is through a process identified as succinct text indexing. And Burroughs, the Burroughs-Wheeler transformation is, is an example of succinct text indexing. Um, and uh, the Burroughs-Wheeler transformation is probably the most um, standardized method of doing mapping um, of next generation sequencing data. Um, it's a tried and true method, it works very well, it has its shortcomings, but it's pretty good overall. So uh, how it works basically is you take, for every exact string match that you find, um, you're basically generating a, a substring search um, by organizing all the suffixes of the text. Um, so you're taking a suffix tree and suffix array approach. So that suffix, that means we're starting from the end of a word, right? Uh, and some examples of this include bow tie 2, BWA, SOAP2, and a whole suite of others. Uh, this process has allowed us to dramatically increase the speed of uh, read alignment or mapping and decreasing the memory footprint. And what it uses is it uses a tree convention, and tree comes from retrieval, uh, for fast string matching. And over here on the right is kind of a demonstration, or a representation, excuse me, of, of how this process works. 
Um, so when I talk about a tree, right, this contains, um, I have here the suffix tree, and if I was to look at it um, described in actual more explicit detail, I have this of uh, the suffix tree, T-R-E-E, -E, over here to sort of show what the T-R-I-E is doing. Um, and uh, what it is, is it's, it's all possible substrings for a reference sequence. So in this case, the reference sequence here is banana, right? And this is what a suffix tree looks like for all possible um, substrings of banana. So you can see there's, you know, the case where we have just banana, there's the case where we have anana, right? So this is N-A-N-A-A. -A -A. We have the case where we have nana, N-A-N-A. -A. We have the case where we have um, uh, uh, N A N A N A N A Anna, right? Na, and then we also just have A, right? So uh, there, there are a variety of different ways. Notice that they always end in a dollar sign. Um, so uh, that that is one of the ways that the, we generate use this information to generate this suffix array. So we take all these different pass through this graph to create this suffix array, right? And then what we do once we have this suffix array, again, remember, this is approach which um, we're using that same graph theoretical approach that we've seen so many times, right? So it's all built on looking at nodes and edges and looking at the path graph that we're looking at the graph that we're here to, to generate and store information. Um, and after we use this suffix array, or, or this, uh, we generate the suffix tree, we're then going to take this BW transformation approach and, uh, and index the methods to reduce the information and make it a little more interpretable. So what we do is, once we have all these suffixes, we'll then sort them alphabetically, right? Uh, so dollar sign is always first, and then we'll, we'll sort them alphabetically. Um, we have a number here associated uh, that represents each of these possible outcomes, right? And this is basically how long that suffix, uh, how long that suffix might be. So for banana, right, the well, the thing that's missing, we're only missing, um, we're not missing any of the word. For anana, we're missing one of the words. So it's just the length of the sequence uh, minus the, the length of the suffix. And then once we have uh, this information uh, established, right, we can then take all of it and align it to each other, right? So we we start with, uh, for the dollar sign, we do dollar sign banana, and that's the, the length of the suffix that comes after it, right? For, for uh, A, we have a, a five um, letter suffix that comes after it. For the next A, we have, for Anna, we have, um, a three letter suffix that comes after it, right? So that's how these suffixes numbers are scored. And what happens is we can just end up saving uh, this information and this information. So we, we can use something called an, an FM index to reduce the amount of information that we need to, to, to keep. And so we end up just keeping this first and this last column of this information. And just that information will allow us to define this reference. Right, and uh, one of the really interesting things about this is now that if we go back and we try to match our read to the suffix tree by going backwards across the tree, we can very quickly match it based on limited information. So we no longer have to cons keep or consider any of this information in the gray, so that dramatically reduces the amount of information that we need to consider and hold on to. Um, so this is one of the, this is an example of a Burroughs-Wheeler transformation, right? And that's this process right here. And then compressing that information with an FM index. There are other variants of this process. So could, we could look at something like splice transcript alignment uh, to a reference sequence or an algorithm known as star um, to see sort of a very explicit case of then how we can take this, this, this process even further, right? And so... Uh, STAR is an alignment uh, program that's that's used in ENCODE, or was used in ENCODE. It was sort of the default aligner. Um, and uh, we know that for aligning uh, reads that come from RNA, uh, 
uh, it's going to present some other challenges than just aligning reads from DNA. And so there are basically two challenges. One is one we always have to deal with, which is the accurate alignment of reads that contain mismatches and insertions and deletions and other things that are caused by genetic variants and sequencing errors. But the second issue is specific to transcriptomics, where when we're looking at transcripts, right, we're we may be trying to map sequences that are derived from non-contiguous genomic regions because they might be spanning a splice junction, right? They might be uh, going over a region where the read is on, uh, comes from two different exons. So how do we map uh, this read that has pieces that come from two exons to a reference where there's a big gap in between? Right. And basically how they do this is through two steps. So we can see here, you know, we have this general approach of succinct text indexing, but now we have to uh, take that model and slightly alter the algorithm. Right. And so the algorithm here is that first we're going to do a searching step where we're going to find seeds just like we did before. And we'll find them where they go in various places on this uh, in this genome. And then once we've searched and found these seeds, Right? We'll do it one time and we'll create seeds for part of the read. And then we'll repeat this process and find seeds for the next part of the read. So it'll do a seed searching step right, for, for the first part of the read. And then it'll just do a seed start searching step for the next part of the read. So it'll try to find seeds. And then it, once it stops being able to find seeds in a contiguous region, it'll start looking to find seeds for the rest of the read. Uh, then it'll undertake a, a clustering, stitching, slash scoring step. And this basically says, now that I've got seeds that all match in different places, I'm going to just stitch them all together, right? So here it's going to find anchors within genomic regions, and it's going to stitch them together. And one thing about STAR uh, and why it's a little bit um, different than, say, like BWA is that uh, it doesn't use an uncompressed suffix. It, uh, it uses an uncompressed suffix array, not a compressed suffix array. So um, it doesn't do the same sort of indexing, FM indexing that we talked about before in the previous example. So it actually takes a longer time to um, generate uh, the references that you need, the uh, reference lookup array that you need to do this kind of work, and it takes up a lot more space. So that's approaches that we would use uh, typically for um, sequence technologies that produce short read sequencing. So um, uh, Illumina sequencing, ion torrent sequencing, back in the day, solid sequencing, all that kind of stuff. But these days, you know, with PacBio and with uh, Oxford Nanopore data, um, we're starting to get longer and longer reads. And um, you also might want just want to uh, map back um, large segments um, to a genome, something along those lines. And so to do this, there's uh, uh, some different approaches that we might use for something like long read alignment. Uh, we're often referring to these approaches as sketch-based algorithms. Um, and the general idea here is that when we think about long reads, is we long reads are longer than short reads, obviously. And if we're going to try to take the same sort of approaches, there's just too much data there. And it just takes so much longer because the read is so much longer. There's too many words in that read. And one of the ways that we deal with this is by generating a summary or a sketch of that read. So we're, we're not going to try to hold on to all of the information. We're just going to hold on to the information that we think is most important in defining uh, the data structures that we're looking at. And so um, in this case, uh, this, what is this sketch? Well, this sketch is um, something that's an approximation. So it's hur uh, a heuristic in some ways, but it's a probabilistic approximation. Um, it's compact, right? It's been compressed into a linear trans, uh, usually, usually into a what we consider to be a linear transformation of the data into a summary of the data, right? So it's a sketch. It's an approximate compact. Uh, compact summary of the data, a sketch. And uh, sketch-based approaches, they generally employ efforts to reduce the di uh, dimensionality uh, of a sequence and transform it into um, this more compact representation. So 
we might think of this as just like a subset of the k-mers that are present in a sequence. Um, and obviously, if we're going to be using a sketch, the longer the string we have, the more amenable it is to compaction. Um, if we have, if our strings are too short, if our reads are too short, there's just not going to be enough information in there for us to, to draw a sketch of it. One that people, that would be easily recognizable. Um, there are also a lot of data reductions that, that um, occur in these sketch-based algorithms that happen through the hash functions, the functions that are going to be used to build the index that represents the reference sequence. Um, Over here on the left, we can see some examples of how these might work. So uh, in part A, um, this is from uh, an online of uh, a paper written by Rowe in Genome Biology. Um, but you can see in this case, uh, there is, uh, if we were to think about data as um, being the sequence, what we need to do is take that data and we'll look at a window at a time, and in that window we'll identify the set of k-mers, and then we'll reduce this set, we'll compact this set of k-mers down into some other sort of sketch. And this is a numerical representation of how we might identify the key components or the anchors that are associated in this um, sketch, and this would be determined by a hash function. And then typically we would go back and we would reevaluate this process to make sure that we were actually, um, this was actually the best representation of this process. Because there's a certain amount of randomness. Because we're only, you know, did we really get the best sketch? Well, we better check and make sure. So we're going to update it and see if that's really the case. And uh, among the different types of sketch-based algorithms, there's a variety of different ones. Um, one of the ones that is most important for us in terms of mapping are these minimal approximations uh, uh, sketch algorithms that are looking at similarities between sets, right? Think about this as trying to find the similarity between two sequences, try to match them to each other, right? To try to map a sequence, an unknown sequence to a known sequence, right? And typically they're using uh, an algorithm that is somewhat based around uh, a Jacquard similarity index. Uh, which is um, can be defined over here as um, equal to the the inter uh, the intersection of a and b divided by the union of a and b. So a classic example here would be like two people comparing record collections, and they each have a hundred records, and they have sixty records in common, uh, and so that means that each of them have forty records that are unique to them. So the the union of their record collection be, would be 140, but the intersection of their record collections would be 60. So the Jacquard similarity would be 60 divided by 140, which is about 0 0.429, I think. Um, so yeah, that's one. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about the similarity. Well, methods like the min hash approach. Um, will use to try to retain the minimal information that they need to do the comparison between those record collections. Um, and, you know, they'll try to figure out if um, when we do this for words, instead of records, we could think about instead of them being words. So how are we going to actually match um, segment words, segments uh, from different sequences to each other? So it's a way to find similarity between them. Uh, there are other kinds of sketch algorithms. There are bloom filters. Uh, bloom filters are used to approximate membership queries. Um, so whether or not two things belong to the same set. Um, there are um, algorithms that are used to approximate distributions, or in this case, Kamer frequencies. Uh, this, um, and then there are uh, Algorithms that we could use to approximate um, set the size of a set. Uh, in this case, we, you know how many distinct cameras what might we find in uh, in an instance. Um, and you know that we've used actually some of these methods and other things that we've done. For instance, when we looked at alignment-free methods for phylogenetic for phylogenetics, you know they were largely based off of um, things like this count min sketch approach uh, where we looked we were looking at approximating 
Kamer frequency. So remember, all this process, the key word here is approximation, but we're trying to approximate this process so we don't have to consider all the data and make it go a lot faster. Um, the ones that are probably the most important for us are these are these min hash methods, uh, and these are these minimization or minimizer methods. Um, some examples include tools like Minimap2 and uh, Winomap, um, where we're looking at these windows across uh, a sequence, right? And we're looking and establishing anchor sequences that we can uh, hold on to and identify the, the least number, the minimal number of these anchor sequences that we can use that we can still retain information about these sequences so that we can do these sort of similarity comparisons and map a sequence back to a reference. Okay, so that's the background of how mapping works. So I think it's just really important to understand that there are different algorithms out there. They have different um, strengths and weaknesses, and they're all not going to behave in the same way. Even if we're thinking about different types of uh, min hash approaches, if we're talking or minimization process versus different types of Burroughs Wheeler transformation approaches, people will take different approaches in different cases to try to identify um, algorithms that either go faster or more accurate or more precise, more reliable, whatever it is. Um, so just keep in mind that those are some of the base approaches, but their implementations can be very specific. So it's important to know the mapping tool that you're using well uh, before you start using it. Have an understanding of what its limitations are. Um, look for computational studies where they explore and discuss these, because it's going to be very important for understanding about where you might want to apply it. Um, so where is mapping applied? Why well, we spend a lot of time talking about why is it important? Well, we use it everywhere in genomics. So we use it in genome assembly, uh, in the scaffolding of contigs, and for estimating things like depth of coverage. We use it in RNA-seq in terms of estimating gene and transcript expression levels. We use it in epigenomics and uh, gene regulation to identify you know, where we might map different regions that uh, represent modified uh, components that might be associated with genomic DNA. Um, we use it to identify un for unknown identification, so we can say, you know, I don't know what something is, something like a small RNA, where, where can I map it to? Um, we can also use it for things like variant identification, so SNP prediction. Um, so some important questions when we think about mapping, like what it might answer, we can say, well, what is it? Like, what does it map? What does this read map to? What is it? Depending upon where it maps to and what that area looks like, we might be able to figure out what it does. And even depending upon the, sequ the experiment that we do, we might actually be able to figure out not only what it is, what it does, but also how does it do what it does, right? Depending upon the experiment, especially when we think about things like these epigenetic approaches. Uh, and over here, this is a, um, a representation in IGB of what it looks like when you map reads to a reference sequence, right? You'll see them pile up in this process. Um, and so this shows that um, this is gene expression piled up, and these are different species. So we can see that in this species, this gene is well expressed, but in another species, it's expressed at a much lower amount. So... Um, When we look at some of the specific areas in more detail about where we use mapping, we can think about transcriptomics as being a very important one. Uh, transcriptomics is the study of the complete set of RNA transcripts um, that are produced by a genome under specific circumstances or in specific cells, uh, or a cell. Uh, and this is often referred to as you know, expression profiling. Uh, we use this for a variety of purposes. We do RNA-seq uh, to generate transcriptome assemblies, you know, what transcripts are present in the RNA fraction. Um, we, use it, we can use it to identify variants. We can use it to do gene expression profiling. We can use it to identify post-transcriptional variants, things that have been edited um, after transcription, to find things that are hard to identify, like fusion genes, to look for co-expression networks, genes that are all active at the same time and possibly working together. Um, and the traditional process for doing this is that we isolate some RNA from a sample. We then get a fraction of RNA. Um, we isolate the fraction from a sample. We get the fraction of RNA that we're interested in. Um, and we do this either through a process of selection. So we either select for poly A 
uh, selected RNA, so RNA that has a poly A tail. Uh, and in eukaryotic systems, this would be anything that is a messenger RNA. We can do ribodepletion, where we could just um, try to take out all the ribosomes, so we only focus on the things that um, we think would, would have functional purpose that are not related to ribosomal activity. Uh, we could isolate by size, uh, our fraction by size, where we might want to target small RNAs because they have specific, um, that specific size class might have specific functional purposes. Uh, and then after we get our fraction, we're, really gonna, we're then going to construct a library from that sample and sequence it and analyze it. Uh, so the power of RNA-seq, it's a really powerful tool uh, for those of you guys who aren't familiar with it. Um, one, we can look at the entire transcriptome. So historically, gene expression uh, studies have been limited to looking at one gene at a time. Um, they are both inductive and deductive. Uh, so, you know, we've talked a lot about this in the past, but it Sometimes people refer to RNA-seq as hypothesis-free science, um, which I don't know if that's a good or bad thing, but it's uh, not uh, inappropriate for us to discuss it in, that, in this context because you could have a very specific uh, question that you're interested, say comparing the difference in gene expression between two species of one gene, but guess what? I'm not limited to just looking at one gene. So when I compare the gene expression between two species, I can actually look at all of the genes that are being expressed. So I don't have to have a hypothesis a priori about, oh, it's just this one gene that I want to look at. I can look at anything. Uh, the other great thing about RNA-seq is it's quantitative. The number of reads that map to a specific region or a specific sequence is going to be equivalent to the level of expression. So the more reads a sample has that map to a region, uh, so in this case we can see that this one has lots of reads and this one has few reads, I mean, we have to control for the number of reads in the sequencing data, but as long as we do that, the relative amount of reads uh, can indicate a higher level expression in one sample, set of samples over another set of samples. Um, it can be strand specific, which is an important thing for um, uh, transcriptomics. Um, it's important for us to know whether or not we're expressing from the positive or negative strand. Um, gives us hints about its functional purposes. Um, and we can also do it on really small amounts of RNA, which is also very interesting. So you can do single cell RNA-seq, where you're looking at the transcriptome of uh, single cells. Uh, so how does this quantification part work, where we identify whether or not, you know, how are we gonna identify and compare things that are expressing in different levels? Um, there's a, a bunch of different terms that you can see has traditionally that have been used. Um, these are referred to as RPKM, FPKM, and TPM. RPKM is uh, the read is known as reads per kilobase per million reads, and that's exactly what it is, right? So it's the we look at a spot on the genome, how many reads map to that spot, per how many kilobases long that window is that you're looking at that spot is, divided by the mil the number of million of reads. Um, uh, per million reads in the sample that you provided. So if it's a five million dollar five million read library, it would be per you have to divide by five, right? Per million reads. If it's a thirty million read library, you divide by thirty, right? So we're trying to control for the amount of sequencing that we've done because if we don't, you know, I might have thirty reads mapped to this region, and you might have three, but if you only had 10 million reads and I had 100 million reads, are they really different or are they the same? Right. Um, fragments per kilobase per million reads is another uh, similar measure. Um, I'll talk about the difference between the two. Uh, but then there's TPM, which is transcripts per million. And it's the proportion of transcripts in the total pool. Um, and uh, these uh, differ um, in some important ways. These metrics differ in some important ways. So for RPKM, basically it's as I described it before, you count out the total reads in a sample as your per million read scaling factor. Uh, and then you count out how many reads are mapping to each reference target. You then take the reads that map to each target um, and you divide it by the scaling factor. Uh, and then you divide it by uh, the um, the length of the of the target that you're looking at. That's your RPKM. FPKM is similar. 
an RPKM, except in this case, FPKM is for paired end sequencing, not single end sequencing. That's the main difference. So when we think about paired end sequencing, right, we wouldn't, if we didn't take into consideration that both pieces are coming from the same fragment, we would mess up our counts. So here, when we have two reads that map um, to, to one fragment, that's important for our consideration of, of, of what we're counting. Um, TPM is similar to the other two, but it's different. In this case, what you're going to do is you're actually going to um, divide the read counts by the length of each transcript first, and this is going to give you uh, reads per kilobase, and then you're going to count up all the reads per kilobase in the sample, and then you're going to divide that by um, to get your per million scaling factor. And then after you have your per million scaling factor, then you're going to take your RPK, your reads per kilobase, and divide that by that scaling factor. So it's a it's a slightly different way of doing the math, um, but it it does actually matter. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that the reason why this matters these are all ways for us measuring relative values. So the actual values um, there's no absolutes. Uh, we're always comparing relative amounts of how much of these reads map. So um, if we think about it in this example over here, say we have genes A, B, C, D, A, B, C, and D. They're all different sizes. They all have different numbers of reads that map to them. These are three different replicates of this. Um, and you can see that there's a different number of reads that map to each one. You can see as we go up in the amount of sequencing, Right, we start to pick up lowly expressed genes. Um, so it's important that we normalize for the depth of sequence and we normalize for the size of the sequence. Because uh, you know, a larger sequence might be more prone to have things map to it than a shorter sequence. It's just because it's longer, it has more space, more reads would come from it. Um, so if we think about what this means is if we were looking at something like RPKM, right? Even though we have 10 reads here. Um, the RPKM value is the same for for A and B because uh, it's twice as long here, so we should have twice as many reads. So RPKM is the same here. So it's an equal. That means that both these genes are are expressed at the same level rather than different level, which would be based on these read counts. And we can see as we go across these replicates, you know, are we seeing consistent results across these replicates? Uh, where it comes in for TPM is if we think about um, the sums of these different columns, right? So this is, um, uh, you know, how much we would expect uh, each of these things to be um, the the total amount of expression of these uh, of these four genes in this sample. What we can see is that when we use TPM, we actually get a more consistent scale, right? So the scale across samples, the scale of these is more consistent. So uh, that means that uh, because these are relative numbers, it, it does a better job of keeping them all on the same relative scale. Once we have those numbers, right, then we have to figure out how to do some stats on them. Basically, um, you know, when we're thinking about things like differential gene expression, is the gene expression the same or different between these two samples? Um, we're doing something that's essentially just a more complicated version of a t-test, um, where we're comparing two samples to each other and trying to figure out whether or not they're the same or different. Um, the thing that makes it a lot more complicated is that the distribution that we're doing the comparison to is not a t-distribution. It is a way, way, way more complicated uh, distribution, so we have to correct for all this non-normality. We have to correct for the fact that we're doing multiple tests, right? So a lot of those might just be significant just by chance alone. So we have to correct for multiple tests and false rates of discovery. We're looking at, you know, maybe tens of thousands to, hunt to uh, uh, thousands of um, tests all occurring at the same time. We can also use it for cluster. We can use this data for clustering, looking for correlated gene expression, um, going from simple to very complicated uh, 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 questions. Um, and we can also use it to um, differentiate functional element representation. So um, are we looking, when we look at the gene ontology, can we see different functional groups um, 
we can look at the count of different functional groups being represented and, and how different those are between different samples or different tissues or something like that. Uh, when we think about the applications to epigenomics, uh, typically we might think of targeting something like DNA methylation so th through something like reduced representation by sulfide sequencing, or looking for nucleosome placement by looking at something like MNase, or histone modifications by looking at ChIP-seq. Um, so all of these are epigenetic markers, which can be involved in explaining why genes are, the mechanisms behind why genes are expressed or not expressed. Um, this is an example from uh, a uh, Sue et al. Um, 2017 paper. And what this shows is some um, results from a bunch of different types of studies, um, uh, different types of epigenetic investigations and gene expression investigations. Um, and so in this case, they're trying to figure out what are the mechanisms that are controlling gene expression of this one gene, GRMZM2G103559. And this gene is um, expressed in maize, shoot, and tassel primordia. And uh, they used a bunch of different methods here. They used MNAs, they looked at short RNAs, they did... Um, that looked at DNA methylation, right, in this gene. And what they found is that, you know, upstream of it in this five prime regulatory region, there's a whole bunch of different things going on. And one of the things that they noticed is that uh, when you look at, uh, for instance, there, when we look at expression between shoot and tassel, we see that shoot is expressed a lot more, uh, or this gene is expressed a lot more in shoot than it is in tassel. And when they looked at DNA methylation data, they found signals of methylation um, in this shoot data upstream of this gene in this regulatory region uh, in these areas where you might have binding to transcription factors. Um, and so it looks like um, that in, uh, that this shoot has a, a change in methylation um, that then can lead to maybe opening up this region to recruit more transcription factors to allow for um, increased binding and, uh, and higher gene level expression in that sample. So again, all of these profiles here are generated from mapping sequencing reads back to specific regions. Variant calling is another place that's really important for mapping, right? In variant calling, we're talking the process by which we identify genetic variants from sequencing data. And these are SNPs and indels. Uh, the process is pretty uh, straightforward. We carry out whole genome sequencing or whole exome sequencing. Um, we then align those sequences back to our reference genome to create some sort of alignment file, alignment map file. And then um, once we have those, we'll then take an algorithmic approach to um, identifying uh, regions that we think are possible variants, and then we'll score those variants uh, based upon evidence. Uh, and so this is an example of how it looks, right? We map these reads back to the genome, and basically everywhere we find variants, things where we see heterozygosity that's different from our reference sequence, right? We'll then look and see, like, is this an, a region that we would identify as a variable region? You can see other ones over here. This looks more like um, these regions might be, uh, there might be some errors in there, some sequencing errors, or some, maybe some real variants. But um, in this case, uh, this looks like a pretty good candidate for, for having a sequencing variant there. And maybe um, this is a gap variant over here. So that's uh, our discussion of mapping. Uh, I hope that gives you a good general background to it and um, provides you with information you need to understand a lot of the papers that we'll be reading.